Hello everyone, welcome to Urbanus podcast. My name is Donatas Rubanas. I'm joined by my colleague Ritis Vishnauskas. Uh, Ritis, welcome on the show. Hello. Today we're going to talk about the end of the regular season almost because still we ha- uh, we have one game to play, uh, Fenerbahce and Maccabi and we will see which team Maccabi will decide to play uh, in the playoffs uh, thanks to your league regulations which allowed to postpone games after the uh, last day of the regular season. Uh, but we will have a separate... Uh, I know, uh, you want to interrupt me about... Uh, a, l- a little bit. I mean, uh-huh. it's, it's such a pity that we have this situation right now, that we have to wait until Maccabi plays their last game uh, against Fenerbahce. And you put Maccabi in a position where they can choose the opponent, which is a bad thing in any sport. That's why they play games at the same time, yes. actually, if that might impact playoff Euroleague bearings didn't or whatsoever. didn't even manage to do that on the very last day of the regular season, which is why... Uh, Anadolu FS Cervenas Vesda game, for example, uh, was finished. Then Real Madrid was still playing their fourth quarter with Bayern Munich. And you give way to a lot of conspiracy theories for people to talk about some teams losing on purpose, choosing their opponent for the playoffs, etc., etc. You can avoid that by simply playing all these games at the same time yeah. and th- this is normal practice in so many leagues and so many championships and i don't know why euroleague doesn't do that themselves the very last day of the regular season should be decided like this all the teams play and they start at the same time games that do not impact the standings you can do whatever you want with them but exactly. right now this postponement of maccabi fenerbahce game I mean, we would like to sit here right now and talk about the playoffs. Mm. But we don't know if Maccabi will play Real Madrid or, or Milano, so we cannot talk about the playoffs now. We have to do it next week. It's an unfortunate situation, and it's another thing that EuroLeague should look at. I mean, the problem with the EuroLeague is that they are never prepared for... Something like or force majeure. And they're not learning from their and mistakes from the past. They make decisions after something happens. They don't have the mechanism prepared for potential issues that might occur during the season. Like you mentioned before the podcast, is it true? I mean, in the NBA, they have scenarios, for example, if some team dies in air crash. It, in the NBA, they have rules and regulations for everything they are prepared for everything they have a plan what they would do if like you said there would be a tragedy a plane catastrophe and how you will deal with the results how you will deal with the team they actually i i believe i don't remember correctly but they have regulations uh, how many players should stay alive okay. for that team to continue okay. the season i mean it it sounds bad but you need to be prepared for everything basically uh, and Euroleague is not prepared for anything and once again we see that we have to wait until the 13th of April for Maccabi and Fenerbahce to play that game and you cannot even start your regular season games that impact each other on the same time I mean come on and once again in, uh, during the playoffs uh, we will have some days uh, when um, we will have two games uh, on quite uh, the same time so we will not be uh, able to watch games separately more or less okay now we have all these uh, platforms which allows you to uh, to re- re-watch the game or you know just uh, change the timing of, of when you're watching the game but it's just it's just what happened with the game five uh, in the last season when we had like three games uh, on the same day and what i don't get it also they made this intriguing euro cup knockout uh, format and it appears out it turns out that uh euro league playoffs and euro cup playoffs they will be played on the same dates more or less it doesn't look like they care that much about the euro cup for, I mean, some, for some reason yeah. there are some good teams in the euro cup you could promote those good teams and try to I don't know, convince people that EuroCup is really worth of your time. But right now, yeah, there's no such thing. Why should I watch a EuroCup game instead of a EuroLeague game if they're both Unless on you're at fan the same of that time? Team. Unless That's I'm a fan yeah. of the team. But I'm not. So uh, obviously I'm going to choose You're not only have basketball. to choose between two EuroLeague, EuroLeague games at the same time, then you have EuroCup game behind you as well. So, so again, let's take an example. 
UEFA Champions League. They play Tuesdays, Wednesdays. Thursdays are for the Europa League, the second competition. Obviously, if you put Europa League on at the same time mm -hmm. that the Champions League is, is, is happening, no one's going to watch the Europa League, which is why you have Thursday nights. I don't know why. During the regular uh, season, it During was the, the regular same. season, it yeah. works. But why do why you do that mix? on the playoffs? Yeah, why yeah. do you mix it? I would like to watch maybe Liat Kabilis Virtus, but if it's clashing with uh, Real Madrid and Adolo FS, I'm not going to watch Liat Kabilis mm -hmm. Virtus. It's very simple. Yeah, so uh, we will discuss uh, EuroLeague playoffs. We will make the EuroLeague playoffs preview next week. Uh, yeah. Uh, we also we will also have a lot of our journalists traveling uh, to all these uh, playoff destinations. For example, I will follow Barcelona and um, Bayern Munich uh, playoff uh, series, both in Barcelona and uh, uh, Munich. Then we will have uh, other uh, colleagues in other cities. And what Jonas asked me to let's say praise ourselves because we. Mm, we were in at least half of regular season games during this EuroLeague season with some exclusive content, uh, which you can follow on basketnews.com. So uh, definitely we will have a lot of more stuff, a lot of more content on basketnews.com during the playoffs. Um, and what is interesting, uh, we have to give a shout out to our playoffs exclusive partner, which is NordVPN, which might help you a little bit uh, to enjoy your league playoffs or NBA play playoffs as well, because uh, they have a great, great um, services, which allows you, uh, for example, to buy some NBA League Pass in more affordable price. For example, if you choose your uh, VPN from India, Argentina, Ukraine, you might get some better prices when you're uh, buying it from, from other re regions and it's completely legal. So that's one of the great uh, NordVPN features. Uh, for example, uh, last night I watched uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona game live, but I wanted to check some highlights of the game on Twitter. And most of the highlights were published by Spanish TVs, for example. And in Lithuania, you cannot watch the highlight, even if it's on Twitter. But I, I connected to some Spanish VPN uh, and I could watch it uh, all. So that's another great feature uh, by NordVPN. They also offer uh, fastest uh, VPN services. Uh, if, you're, if you want to travel um, during the playoffs to watch some great games and, and, and packed uh, your, your, your league gyms, uh, with NordVPN, you can also buy flight tickets uh, cheaper. Uh, for example, I also know for friends uh, who, who try to buy tickets and from Lithuania, with Lithuanian VPE, the there's one price, but if you're buying it from Germany, for example, with German VPN, you can get it uh, way cheaper. So a lot of good stuff and I advise you to visit nordvpn.com slash or bonus and you will get a great, great offer monthly. It's like cheaper uh, than a cup of coffee, at least in Lithuania. We have pretty expensive coffee <laughs> in Lithuania, so in Italy it might be different, but once again, nordvpn.com slash urbonus. It sounds yeah. like VPN does everything except cooking and cleaning. <laughs> more or less, more or less. And you know why we have more expensive coffee? Because in Lithuania we drink coffee from cups size like this. Like that's true. American. Yeah, that's American way. And in Italy it's like this. Yeah, because it's, it's espresso. And all these, and you have uh, to respect the culture. Yeah. And here, you go to a coffee shop and you decide whether you're gonna get medium, which is like this. You're gonna get large, like this, or you can get like half a liter of of coffee. <laughs> but I still don't get it. I mean, in city center of Milan, you can buy cup of black coffee, okay, tall one for like one euro or something like that. In Lithuania, it's almost three euros. It's ridiculous. In the country of coffee, in the expensive town like a uh, city like Milan, you can get it cheaper. So I hope that NordVPN somehow they will let me uh, buy uh, coffee uh, cheaper. <laughs> yeah, that's all about NordVPN. And for today's podcast, uh, we will give some yearly regular season awards. But before that, we must discuss, uh, we must discuss uh, yesterday's El Clasico, uh, another um, Big win for Barcelona against Real Madrid, overtime win by uh, 11 points. A lot of points to discuss probably, right? Where would you start with? I don't know, I would probably... Well, first of all, I only saw the second half mm. because I was working, uh, I, I was watching and, and 
commentating a spectacular game of football during the first half, but from the second half I was uh, fully concentrated on the El Clasico. It was a five-point game at that point, uh, 51-46, something like that. So, first of all, I want to say that Nicolas Loprovitola did some Steph Curry stuff. Not only the buzzer beater um, in the end of the second quarter, but also uh, that moment when he dribbled the ball, the ball extremely low uh -huh. on the floor and he penetrated to the paint. Yeah. He beat all those big guys with, with, his, like three or four with guys. his dribbling yeah. skills and finished with a left-handed layup. It's Steph Curry-like. It was <laughs> one of the most underrated moments of the game wow. because so much stuff uh, was happening around that. Yeah. So, I, I, first of all, I would like to address the, uh, the call. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a clear foul. I don't get all these emotions. I mean, I do get them that it's El Clasico and Pablo Lasso is furious, but it's a clear foul. It's a foul in the middle of the first quarter. Why shouldn't it be a foul in the end of the game? I know it decides the game, but come on, man. Vincent Poirier had Sir Tachon Lee's arm. Exactly. It was he a locked foul. his arm. And that that situation was very specific because, let's say, there are um, two halves of, of it. We should split that situation in, 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 in two moments. If uh, I talked with the president of uh, Lithuanian Referees Association, but I had the same approach on this call like you do. I think it was a clear foul. But he said one important thing. If referee saw all the situation from the beginning, Sertac Shanli was the, he initiated the contact. Because if, if you watch the replay, he was the first to lock arm of Vincent Poirier, although it was not, let's say, dangerous situation because they were still boxing out each other. But Sertac Shanli was the first one. And if the referee saw all the situation from the beginning, even though what happened later, the foul call should be called on Sertac Shanli because he initiated the, the contact. But as he said, it was the last possession of the fourth quarter. Everybody were focused on Nigel Hayes and his three-pointer. Uh, it was almost um, at the buzzer. So a lot of stuff was happening around and probably they missed that first situation. But if they saw only that moment, it was a clear foul call. And uh, what is interesting that uh, he, the Kastutis Pilipauskas, uh, the president of this Lithuanian Asso uh, Referees Association, he said that uh, in this situation, it's, uh, usually both players are locking down each other, mm. but the foul is called on that player who has less chances to get the rebound. So basically the ball decides uh, who is yeah. fault because ball was going to Sertac way. Let's say he had more chances to get the rebound and he was locked, his arm was locked. So that was clear foul call on San Poirier. But yeah, if if the referee saw the play from the beginning, it was a foul on Sertac and Lee and oh. Real Madrid would have won the game. It's more complicated than I thought in yeah. this case because I actually thought that from it was my perspective, uh, after watching the replays, I really thought it's a clear foul on uh. Vincent Poirier and there's and not a lot of even the Questions. contact from Sertac, for me, it it seemed to be like, you know, innocent situation. Okay, he tried to lock his arm, but it was nothing, let's say, extended or whatsoever. Yeah. But he initiated the contact. So in one way, Real Madrid camp, they were right. But, uh, and I, I kind of understand Pablo Lasso because in the press conference, he said that, oh, I watched uh, somebody uh, showed me the... A screenshots of that uh, situation, and I think that it was a uh, foul on Sertac and Lee. Of course, when you look pic at pictures, you might have different view on what uh, had happened, but I think that it was just a um, mm, rookie mistake by Vincent Poirier. I mean, you don't uh, lock anybody's arms with one uh, second uh, to play in the, such the, a situation. The problem, the problem was that time was expiring, really, and yeah. even if Shanley gets some kind mm -hmm. of offensive rebound, Probably he doesn't make a shot because yeah, there's exactly. no time left. Exactly. After the whistle, there were 0.8 seconds, I believe. And Shanley hit only one free throw. And yeah. actually, Sergio Yui had a normal shot. Yeah. He had a... Throughout his career, he it made, was he made good more for difficult him. buzzer yeah. beaters than that. Yeah, it was a good that. shot for Sergio Yui. It was a good shot. It, it didn't go in. And in the overtime, I think Barcelona was pumped from the atmosphere in Palau. Mm. Um Obviously, they were playing without Nikola Mirotic. He was disqualified alongside Alberto Balde. That's another thing yeah. which I didn't like. I mean, I didn't see any punches 
Nobody hit each other. Just a strong push by Nikola Mirotic. Okay, Abalde did something like a headbutt, but it wasn't. It wasn't a headbutt. I think it was a technical foul. You could no give, ejection. You could give technical fouls both ways and yeah. carry on. It's a shame to lose players like Mirotic from a game Once like again. El Clasico, <laughs> but we okay, had this in, in it, it FS happened. game. I think there were a lot of players that actually stepped up. Uh, Dante Exum. First of all, uh, his poster dunk, by the way, <laughs> what a crazy dunk, monster dunk. Uh, also, Nigel Hayes stepped up in the overtime. Serta Shanley himself with his pick and pop yeah. actions. He made important three points. In the overtime, well. they were out, out playing Madrid. But uh, I have to give credit to Real Madrid as well. They are still in a very bad moment this season. They came to the El Clasico after blowing a huge lead in the EuroLeague game against Bayern Munich, even though it didn't mean that much. Yeah. But come on, they lost the fourth quarter. They blew 33 to 8 or Bayern. something yeah. like that. This was crazy scoreline. And in this game, they are with basically one point guard, Sergio Yui. We know the situation with Thomas Hertel. Uh, there are some issues inside of inside the club. Some players were sanctioned, let's say, Ertel, Tompkins. And Lasso goes to this game knowing that if we lose, basically it's impossible to catch Barcelona in the regular season. They will clinch the first spot sooner or later. And they were in the game all the time. <sighs> Only five-point game after two quarters. Barca makes a run. They were up by 11, I believe. But Bar Real Madrid, they always found ways to stay in the game and... First of all, shout out to Gabi Deck. I think right now he is in such a great shape. Next season, if he starts like this, we will be talking about him like one of top three best small forwards in the league. And Barca just couldn't handle Gabi Deck for uh, long stretches in this game. So he was the guy leading Real Madrid. Basically, also some great pick and rolls with Vincent Poirier, also, also points of turn turnovers that Barcelona did. And in the end, as we said, Real Madrid were in position to win. Um, they had a chance. Vincent Poirier's foul. Sergio Yu's buzzer, beat, buzzer beater didn't go in. And in the overtime, I had a feeling that Barcelona will definitely mm. break the game. But from Real Madrid's perspective, I think it was a good performance, knowing all the circumstances mm. around this they team. Played right Barcelona, now. Great, they played in Barcelona. They played in atmosphere yeah. in Palau. It was a good performance, good fight from Madrid, but they just cannot overcome Barca. This season, we saw the Copa del Rey final where Barcelona had to make a huge comeback. Now we saw a very close game that Real Madrid could have won in the last seconds. They didn't. They lose every single El Clasico this season, even though all these games are completely different from each other, mm. if you compare them. Some of them are low-scoring, very defensive, very physical games. The game yesterday was up-tempo, high-scoring game with a lot of three-pointers and everything. Either way, Real Madrid loses. Dante Exum is becoming one of the most spectacular uh, players in Europe at the moment. I mean, the way he dunks the ball, uh, the way he penetrates, and he he it it feels like he just um, he just want to put everybody in poster. And uh, okay, that dunk uh, over Hanga was incredible, but the previous dunk uh, against Vincent Poirier probably it was even better. He beat him in isolation uh, play and he dunked the ball really hard. I mean, he's just fearless player. And in the heat of the moments, uh, in the heat of the game, uh, he kind of uh, lost his mind. And let's say he lost his mind in by Sharuna Sisikavich's standards, and he wasn't so efficient, uh, but the way he plays, oh boy, I just wish he won't go back to the NBA in summer just to chase, chase some NBA opportunities because the future is here for, for him in the, here in Barcelona. Back. He will go back to the NBA. I'm pretty sure. He has his mindset on the NBA. Mm. Yeah, he, he made it pretty clear in, in the interview I had with him in Colnes because I kind of had this wish, you know, to keep him here, and I told him actually that, hey man, you don't go there. I mean, you, you're you're just too good over there. But he said, uh, I know that I will come back in Europe whenever I want. It's true. Yeah, exactly. After uh, this stint with Barcelona, if he decides that he wants to play in Europe after, let's say, two or, or three years, there will be plenty of offers because he's proving that the EuroLeague basketball is as simple as it gets for him. He didn't need any big adjustments in his game to be as successful as he is. 
And we know he's playing in one of the strict systems in Europe, with, with yeah. Coach Jesikiewicz, just in some other teams, you might see even more of his talents, offensive yeah. talents, I mean. And I, I would say that uh, his... Uh, Issues with with shooting freeze are kind of exaggerated. I don't think he's that bad of a shooter. He's a normal spot up shooter. Probably not the best guy to shoot off the dribble, uh, off the screen. But as a spot up shooter from the corners, for example, he can hit those shots. It's mm -hmm. not a huge problem for him. The only thing is that uh, the NBA teams, when when he was drafted, they saw him as the very athletic point guard. A tall point guard who is good on defense, who can create an offense. Now, scouts and teams will not be judging him as a point guard. NBA teams that would like to sign him will be thinking about him as a shooting guard, small forward, something like Bruce Brown is right now in Brooklyn mm -hmm. Nets, a very specific player who can do those specific tasks. And when you judge him by this, he can be a good fit for an NBA team. Dante Exum as the main point guard for the Utah Jazz. It didn't work out, but it's all in the past right now. Mm. And he's still young. He's 25, yeah, 26 25 maybe. or 26 yeah. years yeah. old. I am completely sure that he will be in the NBA next season if he has his mindset on this. And um, after great performances for Barcelona, his agent will definitely have some offers. He will look for opportunities. He will be in the NBA. It's a shame, as you said, because... He's a very exciting player, and we haven't seen everything yet. Mm. But if he wins the EuroLeague with Barca, if he wins the Liga Endesa with Barca, there's nothing left to do. Yeah. <laughs> you continue your journey. You, you go back to the NBA. Yeah, but nothing was given uh, to him. We can remember that he was averaging like three points in his first seven yearly games, and it seemed like he didn't find his role. And I, it it was funny to hear that he, he didn't know plays in the beginning, uh, and uh, in crowded gyms like uh, Belgrade or Athens, he wasn't even hearing what uh, his point guards were saying, what kind of set he has to do. So he just went to the corner and just played from it. And we kind of recognize him as an off ball player in the beginning but now he can he can handle the ball he can create so Shadas gives him point guard roles uh, duties uh, sometimes from time to time he can basically do everything he's he's almost unstoppable in the fast break he it's it's really really hard to beat him uh, offensively i mean he dies for every ball and he can catch every ball if it seemed like you know it it goes uh, out of barcelona way so it's and with this confidence it's just it's just very hard to contain him. But getting back to the game, it was really an amazing El Clasico. So many emotions even Drama. after the game. Yeah. You saw the reactions from Sharas. Uh, Abalde, Mirotic fight in the tunnel. They they kind of continued, you know, talking about that situation. Yeah. Basically, it's just a regular season game, right? But the rivalry is there. And especially in Palau, the tensions are always very high. And you rarely see Pablo Lasso that emotional. Usually you see some, some of those uh, uh, sarcastic smiles after referees' decisions in the EuroLeague games as well. But uh, in this point of the season, I think Pablo Lasso is feeling the pressure and they needed this win really badly, not only for the standings, but just for yeah. them to feel better before the EuroLeague playoff, playoffs, before the most important part of the season that is left. They're losing too many games right now. Even those games where they're facing teams like Manresa or others, they are just losing, losing, losing. And I, I believe the climate inside of that team might not be very good right now. Yeah, they lost six of eight last EuroLeague games. And so many games they just gave away, uh -huh. like... A, in Tel Aviv against Maccabi. They just stopped playing in the fourth quarter. Now against Bayern Munich, again, they had a huge lead. They stopped playing. And this Barca game, as I said, the performance was good. Mm -hmm. The energy levels, the fighting spirit, everything was there. But they just couldn't close the game. They couldn't couldn't win it. And you're thinking about this team. They're, they're stuck with Sergio Yuya as their primary point guard option. Is 
it's a very difficult situation for them to be in right now. Thomas Hertel, as as far as we know, he's not going not no, part there, of the team anymore. There's no way. There are a lot of interesting things about that whole situation. As 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 of right now, we know that both uh, Hert- Hertel and Trey Tompkins they were let's say separated uh, from the team. But from what I've heard, uh, Trey Tompkins' situation is. Um, let's say more simple, uh, uh, in the ACB, uh, last we had to choose one of his three American players, which to left out uh, of the roster for the remaining of the season. It seems like there's not much belief in Trey Tompkins by Pablo Lasso, so that's why he decided to put him out of uh, yearly rotation as well. With Thomas Artella, I've heard uh, a lot of uh, different stuff. Um, this whole situation, this all fuss uh, started with uh, game in Athens, and from what I've heard that... Uh, at least a couple of players, and including Thomas Ertel, they were not very disciplined, let's say, before Panathinaikos game. But it, it was not not just about that. It was, let's say, the last thing that Real Madrid and Pablo Lazo needed, because from what I heard, Lazo had problems with er- Ertel from the beginning in the, in, of the season. And I, I kind of thought about that whole situation that it seems like I mean, it was well prepared plan. Uh, yeah, and continue um, your point about um, some climate problems inside the locker room. It seems like yeah, there's some friction uh, within uh, Real's uh, locker room, and you know, the feedback I'm, I'm receiving uh, connects th- these problems with Thomas Hertel. Let's say yeah. he's not a easy character. Um, they had problems uh, with him and with his personality in Barcelona and his previous uh, teams. And although he's wonderful uh, point guard, there. There are some, let's say, personality issues that it's it's not easy to handle. And then I thought about the situation. It seemed like, you know, Thomas Hertel was like a Trojan horse, which was sent to Madrid by Barcelona. <laughs> you know, you remember all this story. The love for came from Real Madrid to Barcelona. Yeah. And, and he put an amazing performance once again in El Clasico. Yeah, it was another incredible game uh, of La Provital. And yeah, it seems like they left. Ertel in Istanbul on purpose, I think, just to <laughs> script this situation, you know? I think it was it was all prepared. A master plan? Yeah, master plan by, by Barcelona, Shogunas Isikavich, or uh, like who, playing, whoever was behind this decision. Playing 3D chess. Yeah, yeah, so that was yeah another level uh, mm-hmm. chess move by Barcelona, because, yeah, it seemed like, you know, okay, there were more newcomers in this Real Madrid uh, team, but we never heard problems about some locker room yeah. issues uh, in, in this team, and now we're hearing all this uh, fuss around the club like Real Madrid. Yeah, my final thoughts about these two Argentinian guys from, from the El Clasico. Um, I, I, I mentioned La Provitola's performance in his game. I have to mention that the Super Mario image really fits him very well. Mm. I love the stash. <laughs> he <laughs> has his own swag, uh, yeah. Nico. And uh, then about Gabi Deck, when he was leaving Oklahoma, we were actually talking that Barcelona would be a great fit for Gabi Deck. Mm. And I'm trying to imagine Deck on this Barcelona team. I think they would be literally unbeatable <laughs> with Dante Exum and Gabi Deck as mid-season additions. Yeah. They would literally be unbeatable. Abrines is back. He's also playing good. Yeah. You're, you're missing, of course, Corey Higgins. Um, Davis is out, I believe, still for a while. But in general, when you're thinking about the team with Deck, Exum, Mirotic, Kalaitis running the show, Ala Provitola being the energy guy, Jokubaitis, <laughs> these different options they have at center position with Davis, Shanley, Schmitz. Uh, I mean, they would be the they would be unbeatable. Gabi Deck was a player that could improve, for example, a team like Anadolo Efes. They need a small forward, they need a bigger mm-hmm. body. Could be a massive improvement for Barcelona. And Real Madrid. They didn't really need a big body in a small forward position. That's not what they needed. They needed a point guard. But of course, Deck being the, I don't know, Real Madrid's, not patriot, what word I should say, but a player that basically grew up in Real Madrid when he came from Argentina and he became a a star in Europe and went to the NBA. I think it kind of played a role when he chose to go back to Madrid because... uh, from sporting perspective, these other teams, they would be a better fit for Gabi Deck and, and, and they needed Gabi Deck more than mm-hmm. Real Madrid actually needed him. So my final thoughts basically about these two. 
great Argentinian guys, which I, uh, both of them I love seeing in the Argentina national team. Actually, Argentina is one of my favorite national teams because of their spirit. Because of Manu Ginobili. Luis Cola, those legendary players, they, they play until 40. Mm -hmm. You love to see that, really. And I remember the first time we had mid-season awards, Gabi Deck just joined Real Madrid. And I remember, that's another example how things might change very quickly. I remember how much we were praising Real Madrid that, oh, with Gabi Deck now they will be in the stubble. Because they, yeah, because they were on the top of the EuroLeague, I think. And yes. I mean, they looked like a complete team. And there were, it seemed like there were no chance to hurt them in, in any way. And now situation is so much different that we don't know what to expect. They, they're probably facing massive changes in, in summer. The last 11 of 14 last El Clasico since Sharuna Sisikai just took over Barcelona. So Ever since the Copa del Rey final, it hasn't been the same for Real Madrid, honestly. And we're talking about the point guard issue. It's a big part of that. But some internal issues are definitely there also, which we don't know about. But... If something is wrong inside a team, it translates to the court. There's there's no other way. So, uh, But again, they can still save their season. Let's not rule them out. Of course. Uh, and let's start our second part of, of the podcast. We will be giving uh, yearly regular season awards. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Alternative regular season yeah, awards. We're not going to talk about the MVP as we already did yeah. it last week. Yeah, we talked about, we discussed this MVP race very in detail on, on our previous uh, episode. We also discussed coach of the year uh, race. Uh, so some of these uh, awards will be different, but let's start with the all your league team, the first and the second uh, all your league team. And let's go with full five. Yep. And then if there's, we will need to explain and if our picks, uh, mm -hmm. we can do it. So what will be your all your league first team? Yeah, so first of all, the exclamation point, again, we're doing this without the Russian teams. Yeah. We're excluding them from, from these awards. Uh, yeah, all EuroLeague first team. I have Mike James from Monaco. And then last week we were talking a lot about Vasa Mitic in the MVP discussion, but I've read so many comments from people and basically very strong arguments about Shane Larkin's case this yeah. season. So... I was kind of convinced that Larkin deserves more appreciation mm -hmm. for this season. So I'm putting Shane Larkin actually in my all EuroLeague first team mm -hmm. alongside Mike James. So Shane Larkin from Memphis. Then I have two forwards. These were easy decisions. Uh, Sasha Vizenko from Olympiakos and Nikola Mirotic from Barcelona. And at center, I'm going with the good old Eddie Tavares from Real Madrid. You're cheating a little bit, no? Why? Putting Vizenko as a, let's say, small, small forward. forward. Yeah. Can he, Do play, have to can, be can he play the third position? Yeah, of course he can. When when I'm building a all Euroleague team, the same goes with all NBA team. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing guards, forwards, yeah. and center. Okay. And I don't think there's there's any need to put emphasis on who's a shooting guard and who's a small forward. Mm -hmm. And honestly, would you like to have a team with Sasha Vezenkov as a small forward and Nikola Mirotic as of a power not. forward? Yeah. Vazenkov has the skills, the speed and everything to play the third position. I don't think it's a problem. You can call it cheating or whatever. Mm. I think it would be a sin to leave out Vazenkov from the all Euro League first team mm -hmm. after the season he, he had, after the regular season he had. The playoffs are still to come, but this is my first team. Yeah, let's say I try to put it more like traditional way, okay. uh, like Euro League did in, in the past couple of years. Although I, I agree with your uh, five, I mean, the your approach in this, like putting all just best guards, uh, forwards, and, and center. I try to stay, let's say, more traditional, and that's why I put uh, Vasily Misic in the first team, uh, just because I see him as a, let's say, more pure point guard uh, than Chin Larkin or, or Mike James. So I have Misic, Mike James. From the small forwards, I don't see, let's say, elite option uh, for this uh, all your league team, but I took uh, Shawan Shields because although he missed some games, he still played more than 20 games and uh, against the best opponents, he was really good, like scoring 15 points per, per game against top four uh, Euro league clubs. And then I have Nikola Mirotic, of course, and Eddie Tavares uh, as, as a center. Mm. Any any questions? Any doubts? By the way, why you were convinced? I mean, what uh, what was the main argument uh, that you agreed on this uh, Larkin and Mitsich debate? I'm just curious. Uh, that Larkin was more consistent. That uh, basically 
the last three or four games kind of ruined his picture. Uh, but there were some reasons why he played like that. He got into a shooting slump. There was a game where he was sick. His worst performance of the season mm-hmm. or of his whole career, I believe, zero points, minus six efficiency. But people really convinced me that he had better numbers, better shooting percentages, mm, more games where he carried an Adolfes in the first part of the season. Yeah, Larkin was more efficient, although, for example, Mitic averaged 18.1 uh, point, points per game. He's the top scorer of the EuroLeague. Uh, Larkin's average was 14.6, but his performance index, rate, index rating was 18.9, mm. and Mitic had uh, 17.6. So he was not shooting so efficiently. Larkin almost 40% three-point shooting, Mitic 35. I see that Larkin was dishing uh, away more assists, po- uh, 5.3 against four. 4.7 he was uh, turning the ball over less well basically you don't want to leave any of these guys out from the mm. f- all your league first team but if i'm going with mike james there's no possibility to put both us and and larkin and i had to choose one and like i said last week i had my own ideas but yeah sometimes you have to admit that other people have really strong arguments yeah, yeah. And i liked all these arguments actually and honestly. i was i was kind of convinced also i think we had a uh, an article on basketnews.com by mm-hmm. one of our colleagues yeah, about the mvp Arkin discussion was and Larkin was there o- yeah, over Mitch Mitch not, and there were also yeah. some good arguments uh okay so let's let's move to the all your league second team yeah. right so what is your second um team? it's a different type because uh, you have more to choose from uh, when you're building the first team, you're focusing mainly on the teams that are in the playoffs and are with the possibility of making it to the Final Four. For the all Euro League second team, I tried to look at some other players as well from mm. teams that didn't make it to the top eight. Well, first of all, of course, then Vasa Mitsch is my point guard. Mm. There's no question about it. Uh, then I really wanted to have a one guy from Maccabi. I think they deserve a shout from w- for what they did and... They might finish fifth if they win their last game. And uh, I don't think he was very consistent throughout the whole season, especially in the first part of the season. But now when they were making this playoff push, he really played very well, not only scoring, but also dishing assists and doing all the things for his team. Scotty Wilbekin, I'm going to put him in my all EuroLeague second team, although many could disagree and have other names. Uh, then small forward, it's Nikola Kalinic from Zvezda. I just think he had an amazing season. I I think if you take Kalinic from this Zvezda's team, you have Zvezda somewhere at the bottom of the EuroLeague. He was basically the not only the glue guy, he was everything for Cervena Zvezda this season. And the last game of the regular season just proves the point with this near triple-double performance against Anadolu FS. Nikola Kalinic, I think he deserves a spot in in, in this all EuroLeague second mm-hmm. second five. Uh, then Gershon Yabusele, this is a very easy one at the power forward. Great season for, for the Frenchman. Nothing else to be said, mm-hmm. honestly. Okay, and about and, the center. And center. One of the most intriguing and positions. center, probably. I was thinking about different options. Yeah. Again, you're feeling disappointed with Fenerbahce, the way their mm-hmm. season went and everything that happened. But Jan Vesely still has uh, great numbers from this season. And uh, I still think he's one of the top five EuroLeague players in general. So I'm, I'm choosing Jan Vesely. Yeah, okay. So my five is... Costas Lucas, I just think that he's okay, okay. His numbers are not so impressive compared to his colleagues like uh, Dorsey or Vezenko. Although, according to performance index rating, I think he's second best in the Olympiakos team. But let's say his stats, his, his stats line is not so shining. Um, but I think that he's the brain of, of this great Olympiakos is, team and sure. this awesome Olympiakos season. And as I said, I have uh, Larkin because I just think that, you know, I took James and Larkin as my shooting guards and I think that Mike James made impressive job with this Monaco team uh, leading uh, this club to the playoffs. Uh, so I have Lucas and Larkin as my guards. And that's the same debate I had with Maccabi. Had to put somebody from Maccabi out of respect uh, for what they did this season. So and I, had, I had three guys, Wilbekin, Nunnally, and Zizic. Uh, they had great, great season, but I put James Nunnally because he was really 
consistent. He was really uh, efficient. He was scoring almost 14 points per game on, on almost 40% of three-point shooting. And uh, against top four teams, he was averaging uh, more than uh, 13 points. And in the last 10 games, uh, he was the seventh most efficient player uh, according to per uh, player performance uh, perf performance index uh, rating. So that was huge for a late Maccabi run uh, to make it uh, to the playoffs. And of course, it was easy to take Vesenkov as my uh, second best power forward uh, if I went uh, traditional way with these uh, all EuroLeague teams. And for the center, I had this uh, discussion inside myself uh, with uh, Vesely, uh, Zizic, uh, some other guys, but I decided uh, to think out of the box, kind of, and I took Mustafa Fall. I just really love his all-around game, not just because he's very efficient offensively, he's also a very good passer. I mean, teammates uh, love being uh, around him because he's not helping uh, only with his size, but he has great passing abilities uh, because he's very high IQ um, center, which is kind of rare quality for, for Bigs. He's really beloved inside locker room of, of Olympiakos, and of course his defensive uh, presence was huge, not only inside the paint, but the way he uh, played on the switch was really tremendous, and all those, uh, his stats are not so impressive, like almost 9 points per game, 13-14 uh, uh, performance index rating, but I think that he deserved this uh, credit. And yeah, I have three Olympiakos players on this mm. second EuroLeague team. The only problem for me with your approach going traditionally was that uh, there's no space left for Gershania Buscelli and uh, Yeah, he was my third best uh, power forward in this discussion. Yeah, so, so I like the way you managed to make some uh, room for <laughs> Buscelli. But uh, I like your choice of James Nunnally actually. If you look only at the numbers not only had a better season than Nikola Kalinic, I, I yeah. went with Kalinic just because he's the heart and soul of Srivena Zvezda and some things that he did for the Zvezda team to put them in a position to try and chase the playoffs, they're really difficult to measure by stats. Mm. So that that would be my argument. But James Nunnally, one of the key players in Maccabi team. He really recovered from his it, previous it is, it, early experience. It is a good choice. It is a really good choice. Yeah, and that's all for all, uh, our all EuroLeague team. So once again, uh, what do you have for the first and for the, for the second team? Just to summarize. My first team, Mike James, Shane Larkin, Sasha Vizenkov, Nikola Miritic, and Eddie Tavares. Second team, Vasa Micic, Skari Wilbekin, Nikola Kalinic, Gershan Yabusele, and Jan Vesely. Okay, my first team, Micic, Mike James, Shields, Mirotic, Tavares, second team, Slukas, Larkin, Nanali, Vezenkov, and Mustafa Fall. Yeah, Shields is a player I, omi I omitted. He deserves to be mentioned, definitely. He could be in, th in the first or in the second team. He missed some games, like a few months, mm -hmm. because of injury. Um, and I don't have any player from Milan, yeah. in my first and second five, but this just says more about Milan as a team that yeah. they don't really have these spectacular spectacular individual performances, yeah, yeah. but they have a very strong veteran team and they finish the regular season in the third spot. Yeah, and for our, let's say, second award, we had this Batman and Robin award. Yeah. So we had our own Batmans in the last podcast with this MVP race. Yeah. What would be your... Robin Award, <laughs> Robin. although it might be, let's say, disrespectful for some of the uh, players, or let's say, co-MVP, uh, yeah, yeah. the next very important player next to the MVP. I think it's a hard one, but uh, I'm going with Olympiakos in this case, and if we're talking about Sasha Vizenkov being one of the MVP candidates and being one of the best players this season, then Kostas Lukas fits the description of a Robin. Although, as you said, he's the brains yeah. of, the, of the team. He's the point guard. He's running the show. So then it's quite a simple choice for me. Kostas Lukas, one of the best point guards in the league. But again, the star of the team is Sasha Vizenkov. So if Chris Middleton is the Robin to Yanis Antetokounmpo, yeah. then Kostas Lukas is the Robin to Sasha Vizenkov. Yeah, I have this, uh, for this award, I have Vasa Misic slash Shane Larkin because I think it's very hard to find such an equal 
elite players duo in the EuroLeague as we had with Misic and Larkin. And from what we saw, if one of them was missing, I mean, FS, they were in trouble. Uh, Misic, he missed, uh, I think he missed six games. Uh, and uh, no, he missed seven games. And no, yeah, I, I was right. Six games and FS lost three of them. When Larkin was out uh, only once and, and in a single game, FS also lost that game. Of course, uh, he was kind of off. He was kind of out in that game uh, against Monaco uh, when he had some health issues and they also lost that game. So combined, they won only three of seven uh, games when one of these players were out and they're just equally important to this team. We cannot imagine uh, this team being very successful or playing on top five, top four level if, if somebody is missing. And yeah, we had even this debate who is, who is better uh, this season. So just the just that just uh, fits this award the next one is best coaching decision best coaching move best coaching adjustment uh, of the season i'm still thinking about some of them mm. maybe you have something i have sasha bradovic very clear sasha bradovic yeah i mean sometimes we are judging players for underperforming but at the same time, Sasha Bradovic just showed how important coach in Europe might be because we saw a different version of Mike James. We saw that Donatos Matunas turned out to be also a different uh, player. And Sasha Bradovic, I think that he just unleashed the potential of Monaco. He gave clear roles for all of his players. He used the strengths. Um, he was very involved in all uh, process and if we remember that Sasha Bradovic was known as very disciplined, as a hard, demanding coach, he changed a bit. Uh, and for example, what players uh, loved about him was that he was just just passing the ball during the um, shoot arounds on game days, for example. Uh, he was talking with players uh, more. Uh, he was more flexible, uh, not so disciplined as he was uh, before. And he really, he was a glue guy for this team. And uh, when Mitrovic was still at the helm of the uh, Monaco, uh, I mean, there were a lot of players who were almost on their uh, suitcases. They were kind of packed for, for leaving the club. Abradovic came in, they wanted to check how it, it will go with this coach. And now, even on this winning streak, even on this great, great uh, moment of Monaco, he still has to continue all these adjustments. He still has to continue, you know, handling this locker room. With he got a, a lot contract of good egos. Right? Yeah, because uh, it, it, it was um, this option for the next season was locked uh, when he made the playoffs. That was kind of uh, clauses of his uh, contract. So there's still a lot of job, job to do for him, even though the the task was achieved. I mean, Monaco made the playoffs. They saved the place in the EuroLeague for the next season. So he's doing really a good job. And he, once again, he showed you how important the coach in, in Europe is. We were the ones that really doubted this decision by yeah. Monaco. We were very skeptical about it. Uh, I think we would look like fools by listening uh, to the podcast. When it's not we, the when first we, time. When we were talking about... Uh, we we the ruled Maccabi out the of the playoffs. We didn't even well, discuss that. I mean, Ma we Maccabi's case is a little bit different. Maccabi, uh, before the season, I was predicting them the mm. top eight. Then during the season, I thought it's over. Then um, disqualifying the Russian teams really helped them. But still, we but ruled still, them, them, ruled yeah, them we out. We were yeah. still saying they're not going to make it. Uh, but about Sasha, brother, which we were just saying that, look, this team needs a really soft coach. Martin Schiller. We were talking about Martin Schiller. Now it sounds really foolish. They yeah. got a very good coach that is controlling the team and the players look happy and Mike James is satisfied. The coach matches the ambitions of the players. Uh, so yeah, we were so wrong. You could not be more wrong than we were about Sasha Bradovic in Monaco. Uh, but then about the coaching adjustment or decision of yeah. the year as the award is... Um, my coach of the year is Bartzokas. I said it last week, mm -hmm. but mm, the coaching adjustment of the year, I got to give a lot of credit and respect to Andrea Trinchieri for making the playoffs again with all the odds being against him. COVID, players out. Three COVID players uh, injured. Clusters. You don't have training sessions. You don't have any normal ways to prepare for, for games. Then you have those postpone games and you have to play not 
double but triple game weeks. And again, of course, Russian teams were disqualified. It, it helps you, yeah. but you still need to finish the job. You still need to win crucial games. And the biggest one was when they faced Zvezda mm. at home. If they lost it, probably Zvezda would be right now mm -hmm. in the top eight. But Bayern Munich, overcoming all these difficulties, they won the game. Andrea Trinkier, you could see how frustrated he was with his whole situations uh, situation uh, when they lost in uh, Athens in Oaka in the interview for television and Andrea Trunkieri was so mad about mm. this it was a painful how, question to him yeah, yeah it was so unfair why did covid hit us why why are we in this position but for second year in a row Bayern Munich are in the playoffs and to me that's the biggest coaching adjustment that Andrea Trinkieri barely had any games with full roster mm -hmm. but he still brought the best of guys like darren hilliard augie rubit vladimir lucic when he was healthy uh he managed to change the core of the team that was there last year with reynolds with baldwin brought new guys build a team and he's in the playoffs again and he's preparing for a series against shadows and barcelona so I mean, it's it's just an amazing yeah. uh, achievement. The season for Bayern Munich, uh, like I said, the odds were against them from the beginning. Do you remember the beginning of the season? Lucic out. They had COVID players in out. The they had like COVID outburst in the preseason. They started by losing games. I think they got their first win only in in, in Konos after four g losses. And it in was Lu Lucic's comeback yeah. game, and and they barely won it by a yeah, yeah by two points or something uh -huh. like that. And at that moment, you were not thinking that they, they are playoff contenders. They were coming back, that, but then Darren Hillard yeah. got injured for three months. Again. I mean, Otello so Hunter, Corey Walden, they were injured for a month and more they in were the preseason. They were stepping up, like Yaramas, for example. There were games where Andrea Trinkieri, like a genius, played Obst to change the game with his three-point shooting abilities. Mm. We know that Trinkieri is one of the smartest coaches in, in Europe, and he's proven that again this season. Yeah, I had the one-hour conversation with the GM of Bayern, mm, mm, Daniela Bayesi, and I remember he was telling me all these stories. Some of them were off the record, and it was even more painful uh, problems they were going through uh, this year. And I, I kind of, I felt so depressed actually, because it, you know, all these problems just made my head heavy, what they had to go through. Uh, a lot of things were untold and they will they will be because, uh, you know, it, 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 a lot of questions, a lot of situations uh, also are related to um, some serious health issues of some, um, some players because uh, COVID kind of uh, hit them hard, um, leaving some long-term consequences uh, for some Yeah, Lucic was players. saying that he had yeah. problems. Lucic recovering. was out for more than one month. Uh, and even in that game against Jalgiris, he said that he still uh, had a hard time to catch the breath yeah. uh, after that. Some other players had this uh, same thing too. Some some guys were uh, tested positive uh, with two different versions of Corona in, in two weeks. I mean, it was an incredible journey for Bayern. And I just hope that they will... Um, gather themselves for the playoff series because Trinkier is a smart coach. He might make some uh, interesting adjustments to make uh, Barca's life just a little bit harder. He reminds me a lot of Xavi Pascal. The problem is that he doesn't have that quality Xavi Pascal had or that momentum Xavi Pascal had for the playoffs. But yeah, uh, well-deserved award. Uh, the next one, Defensive Player of the Year. We had... Uh, okay, let Let's let's start with your selection. You could go with the obvious one, mm -hmm. which mean, is Walter Tavares. Eddie Tavares, yeah. But I want to award a legend, a player that is never declining, a player that is the Iron Man of the Euroleague. It's Kyle Hines, Sir, Sir, Sir Kyle Hines. Hines. What a legend! What a player! And what a season again! You look at the numbers. You look at everything he's doing. You said that we look like fools predicting Sastam. Now Kyle Hines looks uh, like a fool <laughs> saying, saying that he might retire retirement. after the season. Man, I mean, um, Milan right now, I think they are second in the defensive rating yeah. as, as a team. And Kyle Hines is an integral part of that. Uh, 
there's still no one better than Heinz at guarding all five positions. In the switch all defense, there's still no better player for you to have than Kyle Heinz at center. Uh, his impact is just, I mean, incredible. He makes clutch plays all the time, like blocks or rebounds, plays that decide the game in the end. And when you're defending the final possession of the game, having Kyle Heinz on the court is a huge advantage to you. Uh, and I just want to award Kyle Heinz. Maybe you could argue that centers like Tavares with more blocks, with more everything, uh, deserve this award. But Heinz to me is still so unique, irreplaceable, legendary. And like I said, he's not declining. I don't know. He may he might continue until, until like 43 or 44 Look at his physical shape. It's ridiculous. Every time I look at him, I, I feel bad, really, about well, myself. What a professional he is. I mean, I know uh, I'm, I'm voting for a defensive player of the year, so I'm not um, I'm not going to use it as an argument that he's uh, one of the most vocal players in the EuroLeague, and he's basically the voice of American players in, mm -hmm. in the EuroLeague. But you still want to want to talk about it and mention it because of how much respect Kyle Hines has from his peers. Mm -hmm. Everybody respects Kyle Hines. He's like a godfather of your league, American players. Yeah, and to me, defensive player of the year. Milan are third in the standings. You could say that they were not playing great basketball recently. They were grinding wins. Yeah. But second in defensive rating, imagine where they would be without Kyle Hines. They would be an average defensive team. Yeah, and Look, the thing about best defensive player award is that I kind of had this approach that, okay, Tavares won some consecutive defensive player of the year uh, awards. Now, of course, he's one of the front runners. I also thought about Mustafa Fall because he he's a game changer in, in Olympiacos. But the thing is that when I think about the defensive player of the year, for example, Walter Tavares, I mean, you can use him as kind of a mismatch in some situations. You can uh, attack him in, in, in on the switch uh, with some guards shooting threes or after the screen. With guys like pops. I mean, every time Lakavich was uh, played against Real Madrid, he had one of the best performances of the year because he was just killing him uh, with th quick three pointers after the screen. Because or floaters. Yeah, because Tavares was uh, was that guy uh, who was coming off that screen or he was uh, defending flat. So, I mean, when I think about Kyle Hans. I don't see him as a mismatch in any of the situations. He can switch on a perfect numbers, on elite level. His ISO numbers are great. And sometimes you can think that he can be beaten up in the low post, but it, it's not true. He's so physical. He's so strong that even if he's you have a height advantage, he can even, box you out. We didn't even mention how smart he is. Exactly. So it's just, he, he, he cannot be described as a mismatch. And players like, Fall, although he's great on the switch for, for the guy of his height, Tavares with his qualities, I mean, they have some weaknesses that a lot of coaches are trying to use. Will Heinz, you never emphasize uh, playing offense uh, through a situation where Kyle Heinz is involved. I actually laugh sometimes when the other team is playing a pick and roll. And for example, the point guard is being guarded by Chacho Rodriguez. And then he got he gets the switch, and he's against Heinz. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, just don't call the screen. Attack yeah. Chacho. You put yourself in a <laughs> worse situation, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do it. Why? Why do? You, why do you want to suffer? <laughs> yeah. Why so you you're your voting also. Harder. You're voting also for Kyle yeah, Hines. yeah, yeah, for right. sure, for sure. I didn't. Think I, that. I actually wanted him. I really I thought to you were going to go with with Eddie. Ah, uh, okay. I thought, I thought about so. him, but I just said that you know. Okay. He has some weaknesses, and defensive player of the year, he cannot have any weaknesses on defense, I think. But these are easiest choices when the NBA votes for Rudy Gobert or, mm -hmm. or the EuroLeague votes for Walter Tavares. These are the I miss John Brown because he would be in this John conversation. John Brown would be here in, in the conversation, and maybe we would give him the yeah. award if Unix, let's say, finishes the season fourth or fifth, but it is what it is. Yeah, John Brown, I think, for next season could be a very interesting signing. Right now, he's going to continue in he, Italy, right? Actually, when you were 
when you started your monologue about Kyle Hines, I just saw on Twitter that he signed officially with uh, Brescia. Yeah. Uh, But it's until just the, the end, end of the season. season. Yeah, yeah, of course. He's going to be a very, very wanted EuroLeague player in the yeah. summer. By any team. Like mm -hmm. Barca, Sharas, loves oh, him. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, best rookie of the year. I went with Elio Kobo, actually. Yeah. I mean, they are uh, good players that These were their first seasons in, in the EuroLeague, even though they are quite experienced, but it just happened so they never played in the EuroLeague. Elio Kobo is a young player. He's he's still a developing player. And he proved to everybody how good he is. Right now, he's in a position to choose from uh, very strong elite clubs in Europe or to try and give it a shot again in the NBA. But for Aswell, it was a treasure to have a player like this. Thanks to Tony Parker and Thanks his to Tony connections. Parker. Um, he has a lot of skills. He's left-handed, hitting step back freeze, driving to the paint. Uh, it was difficult for him to stay consistent throughout the whole season because he's still very young and it was his first year in the EuroLeague, but still, I mean, he deserves a lot of praise for what he did this season. I know that in the end, Astral finished only with eight wins but they were sort of competitive and you could not imagine them being competitive without Elio Kobo's number so to me he is the rookie of the year yeah I really loved him in the first uh, half uh, of the season I wanted uh, him in Real Madrid for example uh, for their uh, rebuild Uh, and I think that he was one of the rare rookie examples uh, making the top scorers list, like top 20 or top uh, 30 scorers in the EuroLeague. I think only him and Macon uh, made uh, the list. Uh, but anyways, I decided... Uh, the, the problem with Okobo, as you mentioned, uh, he had injuries in the second part of the season. Mm. Uh, they kind of declined together with uh, Aswell in, in the standings. And the problem is that he was not... He, couldn't stay consistent on the court. And for example, in the second part of the season, uh, he was averaging only 11 points per game with 4.3 assists and 2.7 turnovers. James Harden like dagger and Konos. He had, he had <laughs> many of these daggers. He had many of these daggers. But, um, you know, if he was just a little bit better in the second part of the season, I would go with him. But this time, I'm just too much in love with Devon Hall and Fair how enough. he progressed Fair during enough. the season because since round 22, uh, he was averaging almost 12 points per game uh, against top four uh, EuroLeague teams. He had highest point uh, differential uh, net rating in his team uh, in the second uh, part of the season. Both of his offensive, defensive numbers were huge. He was the leading player in, in both of these categories mm -hmm. in Milan and second best scorer after Shewan Shields. So um, I just liked his transition because he came to Milan on really low money to be kind of a backup spot-up shooter with some, let's say, f physique to be a solid defender. Now, later he stepped up because Troy Daniels was injured, so he used the opportunity, and now Messina gave him keys of the team. He's handling the ball, he's, yeah. he's uh, playing from pick and roll, he's creating for others, he's making his own shots. He's not so, let's say, efficient, he's not very consistent yet with this role, but, you know, he's the he's his rookie in the EuroLeague, although he had some uh, years in, in the NBA, but he still he needs to adjust, and for sure Milan will do everything to continue to extend the, the contract with him, and he has a bright future uh, since Messina also uh, signed an extension uh, or will mm -hmm. sign an extension. So I think that he has uh, big plans for Devon Hall too. Yeah, he became one of their primary ball handlers alongside Delaney well, and, of course, and Rodriguez. Chacha was uh, injured were, at first. That's why there I think issues. they made this move. But uh, then again, they signed players like Troy Daniels, Ryan Grant, uh, Devon Hall in the summer. And these guys were, I would say, under a lot of pressure because you are in a position to replace one of the elite scorers, Kevin Punter, that led the team to the final four last season. And they were one shot away from making it to the final. So I don't know if they felt the pressure, but from fans' perspective, you're pressuring them because you are the people that's supposed to replace Kevin Punter. Now Devon Hall, you're the main shooting guard for the team. So 
people are going to compare you to Kevin Punter. And in terms of scoring in Europe, there's not many better players than Punter is. And Devon Hall is dealing with all these uh, duties very well. Uh, not necessarily scoring a bunch of points. I think his average is like 11 points per game, something something like that. Yeah, yeah. But with very good numbers, with good consistency, and he's unselfish. He's very unselfish. He can pass the mm, ball. Very smart, very intelligent. And again, another, another left-handed player. shooting guard. It's very difficult to guard these left-handed shooting yeah. guards. He's physically you know well that he's player. left. He's a lefty, but you're so used to guarding right-handed players that sometimes you make those mental mistakes. And it's a good choice, f- I think, for, from from your side because obviously, if you compare uh, the the teams, Milan is in the top three. Mm-hmm. Asphalt is almost in the last place, but Elio Kobo just impressed me so yeah, much. Yeah. So I'm going. It was with a pleasure him. to watch him too. What do you think was the what was the best in season front office adjustment of the year? <sighs> Again, we have to go back to hiring Sasha Bradovic, probably, but it was already discussed a lot. Mm. So let's let's not repeat ourselves. But to me, it saved the season. It saved Monaco's team basically, as you said. Some players could have left already. It saved the team, the season. It showed again full capabilities of Mike James. They made the playoffs. And of course, you're thinking right now that Olympiacos is probably the worst matchup they, they could have got from their seven, mm-hmm. seventh uh, seed. seed. Uh, right now, if, if they would play Real Madrid in best of five, I would bet money on Monaco, actually. But they're playing Olympiacos. Yeah. But who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. Sasha Bradovic is a great coach. The chemistry between the players right now seems very good, very solid. I think Olympiacos are in for a tough series. So basically, th- this is, in my opinion, the best GM decision. They didn't hesitate. They didn't wait too long. They decided to replace Vesna Mitrovic and hired Obradovic, which we doubted. The dis- whether the decision is right or wrong at that moment. Yeah, you remember we praised Svezdan Mitrovic a lot because he gave so much yeah. to this club. They won the Euro, the Euro Cup. Cup and everything. Yeah. They didn't stick it was to a painful decision. Yeah, to they save. didn't stick to all these sentiments. Uh-huh. They wanted to save this season. They thought that with the quality in the roster, they can still make the playoffs. And probably there were some discussions with Sasha Bradovic. He had his own ideas how to bring the best out of these players. And right now you see Dwayne Bacon flourishing, Mike James being one of the best players in the league again, Donatas Motiunas, some amazing performances from him, Dante Hall, everybody. So, yeah, I, I, uh, again, I could go with, for example, uh, hiring Dante Exum to improve yeah, your yeah, team and yeah. to replace injured Kari Higgins. It's another genius uh, GM decision. But not many clubs are in a position where they can afford to sign down to Exum. Let's be real about that as well. And Monaco just made the right move at the right time. Yeah, I tried to think about something else when Monaco, but really it's it's hard to match uh, how they build the team on stand, basically, signing Mike James in September, Will Thomas uh, in September as well. Uh, even they, they signed Bacon, we're making a lot of fun uh, of him during this year. Uh, hey, he's scoring. He's scoring like almost 15 points per game in the last 10 yearly games. And they they were really uh, unstoppable in, in the last uh, stretch of the regular season. And with all his uh, of his weaknesses, he also gave a lot uh, to this uh, team. And as I said, you know, uh, switching coaches, uh, sacking uh, coach, which was really beloved uh, in, in the whole Monaco organization. And he still is. It was, they made some great, great moves. And it's, it's really hard to match them. I mean... I also know the worst GM decision during the season. Signing Ty Webster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're trying to save your EuroLeague season and you're signing Ty Webster alongside Zoran Dragic, who barely <laughs> even who played left already. And, and he left. And Ty Webster, you thought that this is the guy, this is the guy that can help us. Yeah, and you decided to... Mm, cut uh, Manuel Moudier and you signed Ty Webster instead of waiting for Moody's potential to show in the second yeah. part of the season. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> it, it probably could be 
Magic Moment of the Season uh, award, but not. Probably we will have uh, another choices for this one. So Most spectacular play of the year. What do you have? There were a lot of uh, a lot good of thing, good I'm things. I'm trying to run them all in my head right now, and I'm just thinking so many. We had crazy endings. game winners uh, from the logo as well, Monaco. We had the shush, all what it caused uh, on the court mm-hmm. and off the court. Mm-hmm. Uh, some amazing games between top teams. It's it's really too hard to remember anything. <sighs> Wow, we had this game that didn't mean anything for Barca basically last week, but Maccabi played an all-star game in Palau <laughs> with alley oops, passes between the legs and everything. The funny thing, Showtime Maccabi. <laughs> the funny thing about Maccabi is uh, you remember you said that they look like a G League team, and uh, I oh, said the style of play. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, uh, maybe I wasn't clear enough, and maybe I was too harsh on them. Yeah. yeah. Or the coach Avi Evan, but I meant that the style of play reminds me yeah, of the yeah. G League, not the quality of play or the professionalism. I'm not questioning the professionalism. These are great players yeah, yeah, they yeah. have. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah. There's n- no need to, for any explanations of of yours. But what is interesting that uh, our podcast was recognized by Israeli media and uh, Walla, uh, one of the probably tough websites in Israel uh, quoted our podcast. So now I'm hated in Israel as well? The funny thing <laughs> is that they put that quote for me. I mean, they quoted me on this for what, what you said. So uh, I don't have I any, can go back to Tel Aviv. any hopes to have any media availability now in Tel Aviv. <laughs> I mean that was oh, that was man. crazy. One of my friends just shared the article and <laughs> said, "Oh, you you said some bold stuff about Maccabi," and I was like, "Okay, I remember what Rita said, but I actually in th- in that pop- podcast I actually said that oh, with the momentum they have, I think that yeah. they still can have some hopes uh, to so win games in the playoff series." Guys, listen, <laughs> uh, don't put the blame on Donatas. He is a journalist. He would like to visit Maccabi from time to I time. I wanted to have Derek Williams on interview. I am so. not a journalist, so put the blame on me. These were my it's, words. It's too late. These were my words. It's too late. And I, I noticed it all before the midnight. It was like si- six Damn hours it. since the in, um, article was published. Nah. There were like 80 co- comments. So He didn't deserve that. <laughs> Why would you do that? Although I kind of agree with what you said because you said some very good things, but there was nothing disrespectful for for any of the players, even even the head coach. I I just questioned Davi Evan, which is, I think, a normal thing to do. I don't don't know his coaching abilities. I don't know how he will match against Lasso, for example, or Messina. We'll see. So moments, magic moments of the season, so many, so many, really. I honestly cannot Mm -hmm. single out one particular dunk or shot or anything like that you could talk about even what happened in milan with fenerbahce uh-huh. and messina and, and after the game yeah Karl heinz then tweeting about it a lot of stuff happened a lot of unusual stuff generally speaking your league regular season was great uh, except from war, which was uh, except from invasion, which also changed the Euroleague basketball picture. But other than that, we had so many interesting stuff, and I hope that playoffs uh, will bring us some other unexpected things playoffs as well. Playoffs will bring us a lot of spectacular games, that is for sure. And we love those teams, we love the coaches and the players. But we are also hoping that the league gives us the opportunity to see everything and follow everything and as it should be. And just do the best they can to promote these playoffs. And that's it. Because we're never questioning the clubs, uh, the passion of the players or the coaches, but sometimes the league just doesn't do yeah. enough. You have so many brilliant stories from yeah, the yeah, season. Exactly. Just so many stories that we cannot even exclude any yeah. of these uh, stories because so much uh, great stuff just happened. Yeah. Anyway, I'm glad about this episode because usually we're trash talking somebody, we're criticizing, we're t- mostly we're talking about problems of some teams, of some players, but 
at least in this segment of awards, <laughs> we were praising everybody. So well, I kind of feel a relief. This is the life of a talking head in yeah. sports. If you're a podcaster, if you're a talking head, basically you're the very smart, know-it-all guy who yeah. never had anything to do with the professional basketball, but you always know what somebody has to do and who they should sign and how he should play or how the referee should whistle. Uh, if you choose to do that, that's what you have to do. And sometimes you look like a fool, as we said. Yeah. So many times we were dead wrong about so many things. But show me, me but any person who was always right in sports. Charles predicting Barkley. Something. <laughs> okay, Charles Barkley. <laughs> or Shaq, I don't know. Man. Linus Glazer probably as well. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, this was a good episode. I like it. Even though I, I wanted to have a, an episode about the playoffs. But mm -hmm. we have to wait. Yeah, we will have this episode on Next Monday. Week. Next yeah. Week. So thank you all for watching. Follow us on basketnews.com. Uh, and also uh, use this uh, great offer of, of nordvpn.com slash or bonus. They're doing some great stuff. They were recognized for becoming the second unicorn in Lithuania, I guess. I mean, they're doing mm -hmm. some great, great business over there. So yeah, shout out to NordVPN and everybody who are watching us. See you soon.